Okay, everyone, we're on the hour, so uh, so let's get started. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Paul Tui from uh, System I Developer. I'd uh, like to welcome you to this session, um, which has been hosted by uh, CNX. And um, just to give you an idea of the format of, of this, I'm going to be talking for about 15 minutes or so, uh, going through some stored procedure basics. And uh, then uh, Rob Swanson from CNX is going to um, tell us all about uh, how to build amazing web ops on IBM I uh, in minutes, not in hours or days, but in minutes. Okay? No coding required, which is, as a programmer, is something I, I absolutely love. Um, uh, just so you know, if you want to grab a copy of my handouts, of my portion of it, uh, you can get it uh, here at this link, which I will drop into the chat in just a couple of seconds. Right, sorry, sorry when I'm finished doing my my, uh, my, my bit of first bit of chat, uh, I will drop it in there. Um, if you have any questions for either myself or Rob during the presentation, I would ask you to put them into the Q&A, please, not into the chat, okay? Uh, the chat we keep for saying things like, hello, I'm Paul, I'm from Dublin, hello from Dublin, <laughs> as everybody has been doing in the chat so far. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A. Um, people are asking about the, um, the, um, uh, with the recordings, the recordings will be available. You use the exact same link uh, that you would to uh, attend here is how you get to the recordings. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the uh, stored procedure uh, basics and getting everybody started with stored procedures. Um, so in the, uh, the first uh, sort of section of this, I'm going to talk about the basics of uh, stored procedures, what they are, how you create them. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about stored procedures uh, that return result sets. Um, okay, so uh, what is a stored procedure? Well, basically a stored procedure is a, uh, a means of calling a program through SQL using an SQL call statement. Uh, please don't confuse this with a call command on IBM I. It is a different thing. It is a call from within uh, SQL. Uh, but basically that's what it is. It's a way of doing a program call. Um, so there are two forms of stored procedures that we have, uh, both external and SQL. So external is a program that's written in another language like RPG, which will be the examples we'll be looking at. And uh, or you can have one that's written just using SQL, using SQL uh, PL, the SQL procedural language. Um, so the big use of stored procedures is mostly in some sort of a distributed application. The, the big benefit that you're getting with the stored procedure is that you can give people access to programs uh, on your system through SQL. And SQL is something that can be accessed from practically any other language. So if I'm using PHP or if I'm using uh, Node.js or Python, or anything, all of those have the ability to call a stored procedure um, and to handle things like result sets, et cetera. So this is just an example of how in a distributive environment, instead of having the client do all of the individual bits and pieces that you ha would have of say doing a select, a couple of updates and insert, and then doing a commit, you could instead just have a stored procedure that you call um, the stored procedure does all of the bits, okay, and then we follow that, uh, you know, just the, the client does uh, a commit. So you get a much better performance with stored procedures, okay, and remember the ability to call the stored procedure since it's through SQL, it's not restricted to just SQL itself because any other language can do that call. Okay, so to create a stored procedure, uh, we do this uh, using the create procedure command in SQL, um, or alternatively, there is a complete uh, GUI in there, a wizard that you can do from within schemas. Um, so you can just do a new procedure, and I'll give you a very quick look at what one of those looks like 
uh, in a while. Okay, so let's get started with a very, very simple stored procedure. So this is an RPG program that I have, a very simple one, that does a uh, temperature conversion. Uh, so it converts from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Um, this is mainly for all of you guys from the US, where you're one of the four countries in the world that still use Fahrenheit as your measurement of temperature. So with this one is hopefully one that you would find useful. Now, I know you may think there's no practical use for this program, but actually a little bit later on, um, Rob is actually going to demonstrate using this stored procedure to you and show you where it actually will be, will be quite useful. So very simply, it just has two parameters, an input parameter, which will be the Celsius value, and then effectively the output parameter, which will be the Fahrenheit conversion. So a very, very simple program. So how do I wrap this program as a stored procedure? Well, this is all I need to say is create or replace the procedure, whatever I want to call it, identify the parameters, and very important, identify what type of parameter they are, in, out, uh, whatever, okay? And there's the external name, the name of the program that gets called. So then if to call it, and remember this is from SQL now, an SQL call, I would say call the procedure, giving it a, with the temperature I want converted, in this case 30.12, and the question mark there for the second parameter. And if I'm doing this in run SQL scripts, this is the response that I get. And I see there that the Fahrenheit is 86.21, okay? uh, uh, being, being the, uh, the conversion. If I was to do this in just SQL using SQL PL, um, I would have done this. I would have said create or replace the procedure again, my parameters, my in and my out. And there between the begin and the end, I'm saying set the Fahrenheit equal to, and there is my formula. Um, in this case here, and just so you're aware of what happens with stored procedures, underneath the covers, what's going to happen here is a program is going to get created. In other words, uh, this will get translated into a C program. Um, and the program that by default, in this case, that would get created would have a name of C underscore T underscore 00001. Now, the only thing that would ever change here, by the way, is that might be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And in a little while, I will show you how to actually give a meaningful name here. Okay. Now, as you can see, this is very, very simple what I'm putting in here to create a procedure. And I'm just going to jump back here so you can see it with that one as well. I mean, it was just a couple of lines of code. But I was kind of cheating here because there were actually a whole bunch of defaults being taken. So, for example, when I was creating the external one, the external procedure, the bits that you see in gray here are the defaults that were being taken. Um, here, when I was doing the one where it was written in SQL, Again, a whole bunch of defaults being taken. Um, now, do I need to worry about these? Well, for all intents and purposes, I will be honest with you, really, no. Yeah. What I can do, though, is that if I was doing this in production, um, I would be, uh, uh, yes, I might be concerned about some of these because from a performance point of view, some of these parameters will affect the performance of the stored procedure. So very quickly, what all of these bits and parameters are. The first thing we have, of course, is we name the procedure. Okay, so that's the long SQL name uh, that we give it. We then have the definition of each parameter. And one of the important thing with stored procedures is you identify how the parameter is used. Is it an in, an input parameter, an out, an output parameter, or in out, which means it's both input and output which would be a standard RPG style uh, parameter. Okay, you would identify the language, okay, of the, uh, that it's written in, okay? Now, by the way, if you don't identify this, and with the default, it'll figure it out. It goes, looks at the program object for an external one, uh, and will pick it up, okay? Specific, the specific name is if you were doing a thing called overloading. So overloading is where I can have multiple stored procedures with the same name, but with a different parameter structure, okay? And what's used there is the specific name is used to identify each of them uh, individually, 
okay? Um, okay, not deterministic and deterministic, one of the options that was in there is one that affects performance. And just basically it says that if you call the, sub the procedure multiple times with the same parameters, well, I'm just going to give you the exact same results. I won't bother calling the procedure a, uh, again. Uh, again, one that affects performance is the data access. We, we sort of say what happens a little bit underneath the covers. Now, if you look at the default that was here, the default said modifies SQL data, which of course was a lie. My program doesn't modify anything. So again, I could make the, the procedure a little bit faster, a little bit quicker, by, uh, if I had specified no SQL. It just means there's less code gets shoved in there. Okay, called on null input means I would have to have logic in there for handling nulls, and I will show you that structure in just a moment. The external name is what identifies the program that gets called. The parameter style, okay, the only time that you really need to change this is if you are if you're wrapping a sub procedure instead of a program. Okay. In other words, if I have a sub procedure and I want to make that available, the parameter style would have to be general or general with nulls. Okay. And then, of course, we had the set option that we saw on the external one. And that set option uh, is the exact same as all a set option with embedded SQL. In other words, it's describing the environment uh, for the SQL. Okay, other options, now some of these we'll see later on, uh, but they weren't in the earlier example, would be dynamic result sets, if we're returning result sets. Program name is when we're creating an SQL procedure, but we don't want the default name being generated, that horrible C underscore T underscore 00001. We want to put in a proper name. And DB info is used with an SQL parameter style, which means that there's a special data structure passed to our program uh, with information about the environment. And then a couple of options on how we would want commitment control uh, to work. Okay, um, actually three three of those that really that affect commitment control. Okay, so a couple of recommendations if you are doing. Um, SQL stored procedures. So this is the same one we were doing before, but I would have put in two things here. I would have put in the program name that I want generated, whatever name I wanted. And I would have usually put in this set option to put in a debug view of star source. So same thing if ever you're creating a program and you want to be able to debug it, you have to set um, the, uh, the debug view. This is just showing you what the wizard would look like for creating it if I was doing that from, from within uh, schemas, okay? Now, a couple of little things just to mention here uh, that I think are worth mentioning. Um, but this is that remember with stored procedures and run SQL scripts, all of the parameters are promptable. So if you type in something, well, sorry, first of all, stored procedures themselves are promptable. So if you type in call and hit F4 and run SQL scripts, it will give you a list of all stored procedures that you can call. If you put in the open and close parenthesis, put the cursor between them, press F4, it will give you a list of all of the parameters. And the parameters, by the way, are they work in the same way as um, parameters for commands on IBM I. In other words, the name identifies the parameters. So calling our procedure here, I could actually put in Fahrenheit and Celsius. You know, they're sort of the wrong way around, but it's valid. It will work it out. In other words, the name identifies uh, the, the parameter. Okay. Um, now, uh, another one just to show you here very quickly. Uh, this example is for syntax only. It's showing you calling a stored procedure in RPG. Okay. So just exec, call, and you just use host variables for the parameters, okay? Now, if you were doing this, by the way, I would say to you, why bother? Um, why not just call the program? You don't need to shove SQL in there. But this would be very handy if there was a stored procedure that wasn't yours that you wanted to be able to call. So for example, if you were calling one of IBM's uh, ones that they make available. 
Now, just in passing, by the way, I wanted to show you what a full uh, SQL parameter style actually looks like, because we were cheating uh, a little bit earlier. Now, what happens is that if your parameter style is SQL, what happens is that all of the parameters also have a null indicator passed for them. There is an SQL state, okay? And these three here, the function name, specific name, and potentially error text that you can set. But for these, okay, it's, um, as you can see earlier, we got away without them. But if you wanted to handle nulls, and or if you wanted to be able to give meaningful messages back through SQL state, this is the full SQL parameter style that you would need to define. Okay, so um, to make sure, uh, sorry, that's, that's it for the first part of my one. I see I have a few questions in here, but I will answer them in the, in the Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to stop sharing here and I am going to uh, hand over to you, Rob. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's see if I get to the right slide here. Okay. So now we're on to the razzle dazzle of the session. And as Paul promised, a, a little practical use case of his uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit converter. So, I uh, don't have a whole lot of time, so uh, just going to go straight into what we're going to show with our uh, our dog and pony here. So let's just, uh, I'm going to switch over to a browser. <clears throat> what I'm showing you here is the Valence portal, which if you download Valence, and I'll show you where you can get that later, it's a free download. Um, you can log into your IBMI right through your browser. Um, so I'm just going to do that right now. And once you're logged in, uh, you'll see something that resembles this. Uh, this is one of our uh, demonstration instances in Chicago. And I'm just going to walk through a few of the things that um, the valence includes just to kind of give you a, a general uh, sense of uh, what valence is. So uh, I'm going to skip down here to the utilities first because we do bundle in some useful utilities, especially for developers. Uh, one of them is called Nitro File Editor. This is basically a browser based uh, you know, physical file or logical file editor. So if you wanted to call up uh, we have this file called demo CMAST, which is a customer master file we use for a lot of our demonstrations. So this is just an example of pulling that up. It's using my library lists, which you assign in your settings, and then you can click on a record and edit it, you know, just like you might do in a, in a green screen equivalent. Um, we have an IFS Explorer. Again, everything running in the browser and all this is uh, um, native on the IBM I. And by the way, if you have any questions while I'm going through this, uh, Richard Malone, my colleague, is on uh, monitoring the Q&A, and he'll pipe in when necessary to, uh, to you know, if we need to, you know, steer the, the session a little bit. Part of my, uh, my slow uh, VPN here is uh, coming into play. But anyway, so this is a, an, a, you know, a tool for just kind of browsing what's on your various, uh, you know, IFS directories, and you can pull up files and... Uh, have a look at them, make some edits and so forth. Um, just convenient because it's right in your browser. So there, there can be a lot of opportunities within your applications where you might want to throw something uh, using this tool up for your users to, to view. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. This is the low code app builder tool that's kind of the meat of the session. Uh, we also have a kind of a nifty little app called Nitro iAdmin. This is also available in your um, in your mobile app, um, I'm sorry for the delay in getting this launched, but basically uh, this is a tool that lets you navigate your IBM I, so you can call it up on your mobile phone or on your desktop browser as I'm doing now, and you can peruse, uh, you know, system activity, user profiles. If someone calls you and says, oh, "I forgot my password," you can go change them here. Um, this is not a very active machine right now, but you can see that there's a call stack, a job log, and open files, all the things you might do, you know, through work, act, job. Um, and you could go to, say, to uh, users and go fix someone's, disable some path, some users or change your passwords and so forth. So just kind of a nifty thing to demonstrate the things you can do in the browser. A spool file viewer that's integrated with the, with the browser lets you... Uh, View and normally these things don't take this long to launch. It's just that I'm <laughs> I'm actually in Costa Rica and I'm going through a VPN, so it's a little slow. But uh, 
Spoolfire Viewer just gives you a, a browser-based uh, mechanism for viewing uh, spool files. So if you had a, an application that was generating spool files, you can set this up so users can go in there and see them and, and uh, view them right on their screen um, and download them to, uh, to PDF if they want to. Um, so if you're a developer in the RPG world, which I imagine most people on this call are, uh, this is a handy tool for testing your, your work. You can make a, a call, an AJAX call to the uh, application, and then it'll return uh, you know, the output from that, uh, from that program. So I know we have some programs called EX Grid All. And I can say load, pass a load grid action. And if I call it, that can verify that the program is actually uh, responding with uh, the response that I want to see. In this case, a JSON response, which is kind of the, the, the language of the web, if you will. Um, skip this one. Uh, Fusion is an integrated uh, 5250 emulator within the browser. So if you uh, have, you know, if you're, if you're a typical site where you still have quite a few green screen applications, uh, you can integrate this within your shop so that people can access, uh, you know, 5250 programs without having to uh, uh, switch to a different uh, application. So you, know, you can do your standard, your standard fare. And just to, so you know, everything within Valence is running in the QHDP server subsystem. So we can page down and we can see this instance I'm in right here is called demo 61C. So we can see those jobs are fired off right here. We've got quite a few instances, instances running on our box, although most of them are currently idle. So, okay, so <clears throat> That's the that's the utilities, and of course, there's administration functions for you know configuring your portal and configuring your users. That would be in the portal admin. Um, there's also instance manager for maintaining multiple instances. You can appear in the set active sessions, kind of like a work act job for the browser. You can see what apps are getting a lot of use and your error log and stuff like that. Um, waiting for this thing to load here, so. <clears throat> You can configure your users and, you know, if you have a green screen or a standard IBMI user profile, you can log in with that, but you can also configure Valence to work with non IBMI users. Perhaps you set it up as a portal for the outside world and they might log in and just use their email address to log in and stuff like that. But you can set up uh, environments with your different library lists and so forth and, you know, set up web services, access remote databases like uh, Oracle or MySQL and all sorts of things like that. So. Don't want to get too deep in the weeds on all the setup stuff. What I wanted to show you is actual the end result of creating a web app in minutes using a low app, a low code app builder tool, which is what Nitro App Builder is. So these are the example apps that we distribute with Valence. So if you click on one of these, it'll basically launch the uh, application, and you can see the end result of a, of a low code defined app. So this is a customer dashboard app. And again, I apologize for the, the delay in loading. It should have been cached, but uh, I think I must have rebooted my browser. Um, so if I click on, you can set up uh, click actions within here. So behind the scenes and all these, it's just basic SQL statements, or even you know you can uh, use a wizard tool to, to pull data. But in, in the end, you're just telling the tool, where do you get the crit critical data on your system? So if I go here and click on Germany, I have it uh, calling another couple um, you know, visual elements to pull in all our customer locations in Germany and some tiles that show in there. And you can you can put uh, click actions within that and drill downs and pop ups and so forth. So there's really no limit to what you can do with that. Um, here's one that's using a lot of SQL utility functions, and this is using the IBMI tables. So it's showing us our, our libraries that are that, are, that have the most uh, content and some elements in the files, and I can link other apps to go pull up from that. Um, close this, sorry. Uh, here's an example of an actual maintenance. So you can use the low code app builder tool, not just for fancy dashboards and inquiries, but also for uh, applications that update data. And if you like to call RPG programs. So if I click on this uh, record, I can see I can maintain the data here. I can define certain fields as non editable, but view only. I can create combo boxes so you can do drop downs on certain appropriate fields. And then when I click save, I can have it, have it configured to say, call an RPG program, validate that the user entered data that makes sense. And if not, send back an error message. 
So that's where the coding comes in if you want, but you don't have, you know, you can do a lot of this without any coding. Um, here's another example of the same concept of maintaining customers visually. So in this case, it shows customers uh, throughout the country. And then if I click on a, a peg, it actually brings up a data entry uh, panel for that. So just to illustrate that there's lots of different ways to configure applications. Um, <clears throat> here's a dashboard example where we have three different visual elements, a grid, a pie chart, and a bar chart. And all these are defined with different click actions. So if I say click on one of the pie slices, it gives me a list of the details behind that pie. Again, all just done with uh, SQL. And uh, just basically, if you know where your data resides, it's really easy to define these. Uh, if I click on one of these uh, product categories, it shows me some historical uh, inventory trends on that. So all this is going over our, our demonstration files that are included with the valence when you, uh, portal when you download it. Um, here's another one using those SQL utility functions. It, it, it's just basically calling you know, job queue, list of job queues, list of IBMI users. It's calling the, the tools for pulling back your disk space and CPU utilization. So just kind of shows that that stuff you that boring the boring UI years you used to with uh, SQL where you get back a you know a text a list of text stuff you can actually turn it into something nice and visual here, and we're going to do that towards the end of this demonstration using Paul's um, Celsius to Fahrenheit converter. Um, and just as a one last thing to demonstrate, uh, here's an order entry app. Um, you can you know just to kind of show that you can really kind of just about do anything you can conceive of. Uh, let me go find one that actually has some lines here, like this one. So <clears throat> you can you can integrate uh, visuals from your IFS. So if you have uh, you know URLs that would take you to a uh, product image, you can incorporate those into your uh, various elements, your widgets within Valence. So and then you can of course you know have pop up windows to add things. You can have look up lookups for different uh, items. So lots of stuff you can do. So, so before I get into how, or to the actual the process of building one of these apps with uh, little or no coding, let me just kind of explain the schematics behind it. So I'm gonna go back to my uh, demonstration and first of all, also talk about what all is included with Valence when you download it. So. Obviously, the portal that you log into, there's a, both a mobile app you can download from Google Play or Apple, you know, the Apple Store. Um, there's an RPG toolkit. So if you want to get deep in the weeds, I'm not really demonstrating that on this session. But if you are a, a hardcore developer and you want to do a lot of the uh, more manual coding, there's a toolkit for calling all the patchy APIs and inter inter interacting with uh, the front end. Uh, the app builder tool, which I'll come back to, I admin, you saw file editor, file explorer and the uh, Fusion uh, 5250 emulator. But the star of the show here is definitely the Nitro App Builder tool. <clears throat> so the anatomy behind a Nitro App is really simple. There's just three elements. The first the most basic element is a data source. So this is where you define, you tell, you tell the application, where are you pulling your data from? It could be from a single file, it could be from multiple files, it could be from views, it could be from remote databases, uh, such as you know SQL Server or, or Oracle. Um, and then once you've got your data source defined, you can map visual tools to depict the data that's coming back from it. So if I have a select statement in an SQL that returns a list, I could depict that in a grid, kind of like a subfile on steroids. Um, I could also put it into a chart if, just, if it's just a basic X and Y kind of response. And then once you have your widgets defined, you place them into an app. And this is the app that, that shows on that uh, launch pad that your users can launch, or you can give them you know, a URL to go straight to it. They don't have to go through a portal necessarily. And then I could have a separate data source with its own visual element, and I can bring that into my app and I can share widgets across different apps. So there's a lot of flexibility in this, uh, in this tool. So once you've defined uh, your data sources and your widgets, you can put them and reuse them to your heart's content in multiple applications. So it makes it really easy to deploy lots of uh, program programs to your users uh, with minimal effort, as you'll hopefully see in a moment. Okay, so the real uh, secret sauce behind the uh, interaction of an app is the behaviors function. And with behaviors, you it's what gives you the ability to have the app respond to user actions. So typically a click. So if a, 
For instance, if someone clicks a bar chart on a widget, it might pop up, or like you saw earlier, they clicked on the pie slice, it might bring up a grid showing the contents, the details behind that, uh, that element. Or they might click a row on a grid and that could bring up uh, you know, a, a map widget to show you know, where that location is uh, using the Google Maps API. And for us developers, you might have a button somewhere or a row and, and you click on it and it actually calls an RPG program and does some business logic or crunching on the back end. Um, this is a great stepping stone if you have a very 5250 centric uh, you know, application. You can, if you can separate the business logic, you can execute a lot of that same code uh, using this, uh, this low code tool on the front end. So. So in a nutshell, what are we solving with this low code tool with Nitro App Builder? Well, basically it takes way too long to create and deploy useful modern, and I emphasize the word modern, web and mobile apps to your IBM users. The demands these days are much tighter than they used to be. What, what you know, a budget of weeks or months has now been constrained to days and sometimes hours. So we need power tools to help us get there faster. And with the web world, you know, a truly modern user interface requires a pretty high skill set, and it can be very intensive time-wise to code manually, and, and there can be a bit of a learning curve. So this tool helps circumvent that. You take your knowledge of the database and your backend RPG skills, and you can build out applications super fast and just reserve the coding for the more complex things. And of course, we've all come to be aware that uh, good resources are hard to find. And there's just pressure on everyone these days to do more with less. So with that said, let's go back to the portal and do another uh, demo. But this time, we're actually going to build an application. So I'm going to launch the, the App Builder tool. And there's two categories here. There's data sources and widgets in one tab, and then there's apps in another. So in the data sources and widgets, you can see some that are already laid out for me that I have tagged as, with the summit tag. And then the apps, I've got two apps here. But I'm gonna start from scratch and just build something interactively right now in just you know in just a few minutes just to kind of get the basic concept through. We won't go too deep in the weeds. So I'm gonna start by adding a data source. So the default mechanism for adding a data source is to do it right through SQL. But I could also, if you notice when I hovered here, there's this little wand, I could do a wizard-based data source. So if I'm not comfortable with SQL, I could say, oh, give, me, give me the data from, from my uh, demo CMAS file. And I'll, I'll skip past the joins and just go right to the columns. I'll say, give me you know, all these different columns. And I'll say, filter, I'll say, just give me a thing where Custno is greater than 1,000. And I don't need to do any group by. I can say order by a customer number. And then that'll give me my response. So I've just built the data source right there by stepping through the wizard. But I really highly recommend using SQL if you if you understand it because it's far simpler. I'll do the same thing through SQL. So select all of all the columns from demo CMast where Custno is greater than one thousand. Order by Custno. So that's basically going to give me the same thing. You can see the preview comes back with the same information. And you can really do just about anything you can think of, uh, you know, any kind of complex joins, CTEs, you know, with clauses, uh, you know, groups, joins, anything you can do in SQL, you can call ut SQL utilities, um, use views and so forth, anything you can conceive of, you can do this way. And so it's a great way to take, you know, when you've been honing up your SQL skills and you've developed a really complex SQL statement, say, in, in run SQL scripts, you can just take that, copy it, paste it right here, and turn it into a data source, you know, lickety split. So I'm going to create this data source. We'll call it uh, we'll call it Paul Customers. This is his Paul Tui session. Let me give it a, a tag of Paul just to make it easy to find. <clears throat> so let's switch this to Paul. Okay, so we got our data source. So now let's build a uh, a, a grid widget over that. So I'm gonna say create a widget. I'm gonna say create it, make a grid. There's all different types of grids. I won't get too deep in the weeds on that, but you could have edit grids and tree grids and pivot tables and all sorts of things. But this is just a straightforward list. So just to get it started, I'm gonna say select everything. 
I'm going to refine my columns a little bit here. So if I scroll this up, I can kind of see it's, it's showing me what it's about to look like based on the default labels that come from the, uh, the physical file definition. So I'm just going to uh, shorten these down a little bit. Call this address line one. I'll just omit this one from there. Call this one city. State. Country. Zip code and we'll just constrain this a little bit. We'll say year to date sales. And you'll notice that we use this concept by default called flex width. It looks, it interrogates the file definition and looks and sees how, what's the relative width of all these things. So state has a relative width of one and a customer name has a relative width of four. So you'll notice the customer name is basically four times as wide as the state. And I'll center that just to make it look a little better. So that means if your users have different, you know, some people have less resolution on their displays than others. So if I shrink, the screen, you can see it's staying, everything's staying relative. It's all showing the same. Now, now when you'll notice some things start to truncate, but basically the, the column widths are all relative to each other in the default sense. But if I know I want to always have something be a specific width, I could say, okay, I always make the customer number, you know, 65 pixels. And that'll lock that down to that width. And then everything else remaining is relative to what, what's not fixed. So there's lots of different things you can do with that to kind of constrain uh, and, and refine the sizes of your of your displays. So um, I'll do one other thing here real quick. I'm going to format the sales. I have our global default date format set as month, day, year, but you can switch that to ISO or day, month, year, whatever you prefer. Um, I'm going to change that. I'm going to put a formatter on the, on the sales. I know it's US dollars, so that'll just give us a little bit more uh, resolution on that so it looks more you know comfortable to the users. On the configure tab, I can let the users say resize or move columns around, let them hide them if they want. Um, I'll switch to a slim slim view UI that gives me a little bit more uh, rows per page. And you'll know that when I say paging, you know, this is kind of like the same as a paging subfile. We have a paging grid. We're loading in this case 25 records at a time. But I only have 202 records in my in my uh, in my customer database, so I could say, you know, let them load uh, 250 at a time, or I could just turn paging off if I know it's going to be a, a relatively small list, and then they just see the whole thing when they come in. So that's kind of nice if you have, if you know, you know your database. Obviously, you know when you have uh, small files versus large files. I can put a global search in there, uh, which I'll, with all sorts of different. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, operators. So that way, if I just type, say, Chicago, I can see it's searching all the alphanumeric uh, or alpha, you know, the character columns for the word Chicago and everywhere it found it, it brought it back. You can also do filters on specific columns. So I could say, let's do a filter on the state. And that will uh, bring up a little state filter. Let me find this a little bit. Uh, turn off the allow reset. There you go. That just gets rid of this. So I can say, show me everything in Illinois. And of course, I can turn this into a drop down list and just show all the 50 states or if I had countries and a list of country codes, it could do that as well. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Oh, I, should, I neglected to mention downloads. Users love spreadsheets. So there's all you can say, let them you know download to Excel. It'll be a yes give it a name and so forth. You can do PDFs, CSVs, XML, all sorts of different downloads. But generally speaking, whenever you create a grid, just check this box so users can create a spreadsheet of the data because they love that. Okay, so I'm going to call this Paul's customers. Paul, oh, I got a lot of customers. Okay, so now I've got two components here. I've got a data source and I've got a... Uh, grid widget mapped over it. So now I'm just going to go really quick, just create an app. Um, let me switch this uh, to Paul. I'm going to create an app now, and I'm going to say, let's bring in, let's do where my Paul widgets are. I got, got my Paul's customers widget. So I'm just going to put that in there right now. We'll call it Paul's customers. And I'm just going to leave it at that right now, and I'll save it. Um, I can say indicate if it's available to mobile or desktop or both. 
and I'm going to put it in the administration category so it shows up up top. And obviously, there's all sorts of things you can do for uh, making uh, certain users allowed to run it and other ones not based on group membership and authority settings and so forth. So anyway, so here's my my uh, my app that I just built right before your eyes and it doesn't do a whole lot. I just have a basic filter in, in my global search field, but I could refine this, obviously. So let's, uh, let's see what time. Okay. Rob, can so I let's add, let's start. Yes. Rob, can I interrupt you for a second? Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Richard Malone. I'm watching the Q&A as Rob does his presentation. So I'll just give a little commercial to everyone. If you have a question, I'm monitoring the Q&A. So just go ahead and ask a question in there. But somebody asked if Valence can handle files with millions of records. And I thought it might be a good idea to just sort of address that live. Yeah, well, that's where that paging would come into account. You would obviously want to try to load a million records into your browser, just like you wouldn't want, want to load a million subfile records in a, in a green screen program. So when you know your file is really big, make sure you have paging turned on. It's turned off in this case. But if I just go back and turn it back on just for uh, demonstration purposes. We'll just say we want to uh, make paging active and we'll have 100 records per page. So I'll save that. Well, actually, you'll see it right down here. So now I've got page one, page two, page three. So it's only going to load, you know, in this case, 100 records at a time. So, And if you do have a file with millions of records and uh, the user like clicks a sort column, on uh, you know a column that you don't have an index set on the database, that's something you might need to restrict or set up new indexes if the user might have to sort in that direction a lot. Right, that's a good point. So you may recall when I was configuring this grid, I said, let users sort on any column they want. So I could say, let's sort on city. And if you had a million records and you didn't have an index on city, that might actually take a long time. Uh, in this case, it's only you know 202 records, so the uh, SQL engine can have to handle it, no problem. But uh, and you can also have multi-column sort. You could have a primary and secondary and tertiary and so forth column. I don't have that turned on right here, but um, yeah. So and then users just really generally warm up to these really quick because they love being able to move columns around. Maybe some people like to see the state in front of the city, and it'll remember that. So if I close it and relaunch it, it'll it'll keep those settings. Uh, so it's kind of gives the users a, a little bit of ownership into the apps that they can make them, you know, configure them to look the way they like them to and, and uh, you know, make them widen columns as necessary. And, and that, those are just kind of nice features that help, you know, people, you know, work their way out of the 5250 world that they're so comfortable with when they see, oh, there's some nice features here. And of course, downloading to Excel, that's something that every user loves to get to. And uh, I actually don't have Excel, this is a Mac, so I'm gonna, it's gonna open this up in, uh, in numbers, but, uh, See, I'll pull that up here. <clears throat> so they can slice and dice it however they want then in their in their uh, spreadsheet application. So okay, so let's go embellish this a little bit and throw something else in there. So um, let me go back to App Builder, and I think what I would like to do is add another uh, widget over the same data source, the the list. But this time I'm going to do a uh, a map widget. So a map widget is just used in the Google Maps API, and all it needs to know is which columns or fields in your file represent the address. So I'm going to say the first line of the address, city, state, country. And as soon as you give, provide that, it knows how to, to go. It'll go find the first record in the file and, and map it for you just to show that it's uh, succeeding in finding it. And then we can, uh, you know, say whenever they click on a tile, I want it to show the name. You could have all sorts of other functions for this too, but I'll just leave it at that for now. So now I've got that. I've got another widget created over the same data source. So I'm going to call it calls customer location. So now we can go back to the app and let's not tag that right. Let's put that in here. I'm going to go back into this app. I'm going to bring that map widget into this application. So we'll, uh, let's see, let's uh, add a widget. 
I got so many things in here. I'm going to say, let's bring this location in and I'm going to say, show it as a pop up. So now I have this widget added here. You can see it's it's showing as a pop up, it's showing me a few pegs. And I want it now. The next thing I want to do is I want to link it together. So I'm going to say, when the user clicks a row, show the location of that customer. So I'm going to say, click on here, behaviors. I'm going to say, so behaviors brings me up the basically components within the app. I'm going to say, here's my, uh, my grid widget. When they click on a row, I want to filter another widget. And the widget I want to filter is the only other one in my app, which is the pop-up, I'm sorry, the map. And I'm a, the, the filter, the way I link the two together is by the customer number. They're both mapped over the same data source. It just needs to know what's the common relationship. So when I click on the customer record, I want to bring up that customer's address. And I could say uh, you know, location of. Okay, so that's brought in there. When I click on a row, I'm going to filter the, uh, the, the map widget and show it as a pop-up. So if we just save that now, and go back and launch it again. Uh, if I click on American Airlines, it should bring me up the location of where that's located. And it's you can configure you know the type of map display you want. Do you want it to be a uh, you know, satellite view? Do you want it to be a uh, map view by default? And all that, all the things you can do in Google Maps, basically. So. Let's uh, let's see what time is it here. We got. Uh, I'm going to do one more thing on this. I'm going to create another data source of a um, list of customers. So I'm going to add a data source. I just know the file is called select everything from demo board h. I think is that it? There's a board demo board underscore h. There we go. So it's how it's actually helping me out. It's showing me, okay, here's the file, here's all the columns. And if I leave it as star, it's just going to bring them all in. And I could uh, say order by order no. So there's my list of customer orders from my order header file. So I'm going to save that and I'm going to say Paul's customer orders. So now let's create a grid widget over that list of, of customer orders. So I'm going to do the same thing I did before a grid widget. I'm just going to real quickly just select all the columns, maybe just take a few of them off. Let's say city. And yeah. Ship date. Country. City. We don't need the customer number. And we'll just make this uh, order number. So just quick and dirty, just a you know list of columns. I could refine this a little bit more. Maybe I'll just real quick just constrain some of these I know are going to be smaller. And make this uh, okay. So let's just uh, uh, we'll do the usual. Give them the the option to. Uh, Pay, well, we'll page it at uh, 250 per page, and we'll give them the ability to download it to Excel. Okay. Customer order grid. Okay. So let's bring this into our app just to add one last, uh, one last component to it. So. What I'll do in this case is I'll I'll add a uh, I'll add a button to the row that's uh, actually what I what I think I'll do is uh, twofold I'll do uh, I'm going to do what's it called the add a add a row menu button I'm going to say show location so instead of just clicking on the on the row without knowing what it's going to do, I'm going to give them a little uh, row menu button. And when this happens, I'm going to I'm going to have it do the filter widget that we did before. Cusno equals Cusno. Okay, I'll take off this other one here. 
So I got one row, me row menu button that's going to basically show the location. Now I'm going to add another one to show those customer orders that we just had. So I'm going to say, uh, add another row menu. Oops, sorry. Let me right here. Add another button. Oops, doing it wrong here. Uh, show orders. When they click on this, I'm going to filter. Oh, I didn't bring in my, I didn't bring it in yet. Sorry about that. Let me go back here. So I'll save this. I'll just for now, I'll just say just uh, filter the, the same widget. I'll come back and change that. Okay, so I want to add the widget to my to my uh, display. So I'm going to add. Oops, I think I picked the wrong one. And add Paul's order grid. I won't do it as a pop-up this time. I'll just have it actually show it in the bottom half or maybe we'll move it up and show it to the right. Okay, so now I need to just link the two. So I'm gonna say Paul's customers, when they click on, I have this uh, show orders. Instead of showing a map, I'm gonna change it now to say, uh, let me actually just get rid of this. When they click on it, I want them to, oops, sorry, filter all his customer orders by customer number. I'm going to say this is orders for customer. Okay, so just real quick, we'll just go see what that does. Hopefully I did it right. Launch it again. So, oh, I did it wrong. I have the show location. I, I actually have it uh, showing that I need to tell it to not show it initially. So let me change that. This grid should be hidden initially. So I'm going to say don't show it until someone does a click. And let's just make sure I got my behaviors right here. Show orders. I got that in the wrong spot. Okay. So I have probably done this a little a little more clearly, but I just wanted to whip through it real quick just to show you that you, the concept is there. So now I got two buttons. I can show the location of the customer, or I can bring up the orders for the customer. And I might want to do that in a pop up. I, I didn't put this the title, but you get the idea. Basically, all this stuff you can do as long as you know where your data is, you can quickly whip through and build applications without having to do any coding other than SQL if you consider that coding. So now just to do a quick tie in to what Paul is uh, teaching about the uh, stored um, stored procedures, let's uh, let's go do one more little thing. I've, I've created another beforehand, I created another um, widget, a form widget that actually uh, calls an RPG program. So I think I actually tagged that summit. So we have this little, <clears throat> form here where I can type in Celsius and it's going to call uh, it's going to call the uh, uh, store procedure on the back end which I'll show you here in a second so we have let's see I think I call this uh, summit two so I have a little RPG program here that's going to do the exec SQL to call summits uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit procedure. We're going to pass in the Celsius and we're going to get the temperature in Fahrenheit back. And then this is all explained in the documentation, but you can use procedures to send that data back to the front end. So if I bring that into my application, so I'm going to go back into the uh, back into the application here. 
And just for the heck of it, we'll just add a button to the to the top of the form. So we'll say we'll add a button called temperature blessing. Maybe I'll even bring in an icon just to make it more pretty. And then when I click on this button, I want to call. I want to basically uh, let's see. I want to filter. I want to show widget. I want to show which which <laughs> I did it again. I didn't bring the widget into my app. Let me do that real quick. How are we doing on time, Richard? Uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Paul will answer that. You've got, you've got, you've got about five, or five minutes, but I can, give you, I can give you six and a half. Okay, all right. Well, rather than doing this uh, right here, I'll just show you the, the result here I got. So we have, we have an application here with, uh, a list of customers and a button to bring up the map. And in this case, we're actually using a form that in the back end is calling the uh, a form widget that bring, bring, is actually calling an external web service. So let me show you how that works. So we are using a form with an external web, web service and you can see we're doing a select and, and if you're familiar at all with the web services and I can provide you the source code for this, but this is basically calling an open weather map API. It brings back the current uh, temperature and we're deliberately bringing it back in metric, you can see here. And then we're using the two Fahrenheit to convert it. Now two Fahrenheit is a service program and this might be something Paul's gonna show. I have a service program called utils which is just basically calling that uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit procedure and converting it into uh, converting the Celsius input into Fahrenheit and sending it back. So you can bring it into an SQL statement using a function as a wrapper to call the stored procedure, which is what we're doing here. So that, that way you can see a practical example of that in action. And just to show that other RPG program in action, I think I have this already done. Just to save time, I'm just going to re-enable an app that I disabled earlier. Let's see. I got it filtered, that's why. There we go. I'm missing it. This is something we did for a, a common demonstration. So I just added a button to this app with a temperature lesson like I was trying to do. And that brings up a widget that just basically let me say, okay, let's type in 25. It's going to bring back the temperature in Fahrenheit. Uh, or we added some little pizzazz that changed the color uh, based on uh, the, uh, whether it's considered hot or cold, since some, some of us aren't familiar with Fahrenheit and don't know what the difference is. So, <laughs> so uh, just to explain how that works, going back to the back end here, um, I had to call on an RPG program. I configured the form to call this convert T2. And you can see that it's just basically uh, getting, getting a form value back from the front end, calling this procedure to convert it and then sending the response back. So we made a fancy, the, the more simple function without all the markup is just this. So this is, a, this is the RPG program in its entirety. We pull in the temperature in Celsius, we call the stored procedure, and then we send it back to the front end. We have a set app variable called temp and F, which is what I defined on the front end, and then we set the response to true. So. So long and the short is with this Nitro App Builder tool, you can, with your knowledge of the database, you can whip your way through uh, creating applications and deploying them to your users. Um, they can either launch them from the from this port, they can log into the portal just like I'm doing here, and they can uh, launch them as tiles if they're authorized and they see them, or you can set them up as URLs that they can just click right in their you know bookmark and go right to them or even send it to them in an email. And just uh, as another example of something I did earlier, uh, here's a dashboard with uh, 
basically three widgets using backend data sources that are pulling data from web services. So he has a, there's a lot of use for calling web service APIs. And with Valence you, or with Nitro App Builder, you can set those SQLs up and very quickly pull data from any, any web service. Of course, this is being very slow on me right now. But uh, when this comes up, you'll see there's a widget for pulling in cryptocurrencies from one API. There's a weather API, and then there's also an oil price API. There we go. So this is just pulling back a list of oil prices. And if you're interested in playing with this on your system, I can send you the, the, the uh, we can export the, the apps and data sources and you can import them right there and you can tinker with them on your own. But the nice thing is if your company has any interaction with commodity pricing or any kind of data that would be useful for your user, users to see in alongside your company data, you can use Nitro App Builder and Valence to tie it all together and give them a nice, uh, you know, nice visual view of what's going on with their with their business and relative to you know world world events and commodity prices and things like that. So, did I uh, did I miss anything, Richard? We worked. Oh, I guess I, I one thing I should uh, mention is basically um, yeah, <clears throat> just how how to get Valence. Uh, yeah, so you can go some to questions. this URL to download Valence. Uh, it's really easy. I'll just to, just to demonstrate here. Uh, you just go up here to downloads and just click the latest version is Valence 6.1. If it, as long as you're on uh, IBM iOS 7.2 or higher, you can click download and it will give you the, the download form and you can install it and be up and running within a few minutes on your system. Um, and that, that, that works a, on a free trial basis for 30 days. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, I didn't, there's no open questions right now. I don't know if we have a, a minute or two for me to sort of recap the common ones I was seeing. Paul, do I have a minute to just sort of. Yep. I can give you a minute. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, there were a couple of questions about role-based security. Um, like I, I think there were some concerns from people seeing what you had access to Rob, like the IFS and, you know, editing tables and everything. And I just wanted to point out that Rob being an administrator in Valence, he has access to do everything. So, but you know, if you create an application for your end users, you use the Valence portal to create security groups and you just deploy only those things you want to go out to your users. They would not have access to like editing tables through the file editor and the IFS and things like that you saw Rob demonstrating there. That's just for developers and administrators. Um, the other thing is, is there were questions about whether or not you can uh, have users update data as, and I, I answered them already in the Q&A that the answer is yes. And you can use the Nitro App Builder to create all kinds of apps, so updating you know, pretty much anything that you can think of um, can be done. And you can also have some users have the ability to just view and some users can update. And it's as the developer, it's your decision and how you design that. Those features are built within uh, Nitro App Builder to specify that. And that's pretty much all I wanted to clarify. They seem to be the common questions. Yeah, and just to illustrate, I just logged in as a dummy user, and it has far fewer uh, authorities, so it doesn't see as many of the applications. So you can figure you could have an accounting department, you could have a shop floor department, and they can all have different apps based on their group membership, and you can also have overrides at the user level. Okay, cool. thanks. So if, if anybody has any more questions, please just drop, you know, for, for Rob and, and Richard, please just drop them into the Q&A. And I will give a couple of minutes at the end when I'm finished uh, in case there are any questions that need to be answered in person as opposed to just uh, typing the answers. Okay. So, Rob, you want to give me back control there, please? All right. Okay. Sir. So. Um, so just before I get back to the next part of my uh, of demonstration, I just, based on a couple of the questions I was getting in the Q&A, um, just to let people know, if you're doing anything with SQL, and especially with stored procedures, the preferred interface is run SQL scripts. Um, it, it really is kind of the handiest one uh, to use. Um, 
the uh, remember as i said just for simple things like being able to prompt so here i'm going to call a stored procedure i hit f4 for prompt there it's showing me the parameters i'm going to select both of them it plugs them in and now i just put in the values i want and we'll be looking at this stored procedure in a second and for the second parameter i'm putting in just a parameter marker because this is a returned uh, parameter. Um, so when I run this, just so you see how this works, I get my result set. This is the result set coming back from the stored procedure. But if I look at the messages, in the messages here, I know it's a little bit hard to see with the gold. Um, but here, uh, up, 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 where am I? There we go. The output parameter two description hammers and widgets is a return value coming back from the procedure. Okay, so ju just wanted you to be able to, uh, uh, to see that. Um, okay, so uh, let me get back to my presentation here. Okay, and the next bit that we're gonna be looking at here is uh, stored procedures that return result sets. Um, so this means that, um, you know, especially if you're looking for lists, well, obviously a store procedure that returns a result set can do this. And again, just about any connection uh, that you can have to the system, um, any of the usual ways of connecting can, can all process the result sets uh, from calls to stored procedures. And also, by the way, just to be aware, is a stored procedure can return multiple result sets, not just one. Okay. Um, actually, in one of our own applications that we use for a lot of statistical information, um, I have one store procedure that returns 12 uh, result sets. Mm, go figure. Um, one of the important things when you're using external procedures that return a result set, please make sure that you don't use activation group star new, because that means you won't get a result set. Okay. Just to be aware of that. So there are, um, there are two ways of returning result sets uh, from external programs. You can either return an open SQL cursor or you can turn, return an array. Um, so you can uh, populate a, a data structure array and return that array. And we're, we're going to look at all of these. The things to be aware of here with external programs is regardless of how you're doing it, the program has to be an SQL or PGLE program because you are going to have at least one SQL statement in there, uh, as we'll see. And this will be a set result uh, statement. So we're going to look at an example, uh, the one I just ran actually, which will return a list of um, uh, products for a product category. So you, you know, pass in a parameter for a category code and it returns a list of products that are in that category. And we're going to look at three different ways of doing this, um, either doing it with a by returning a cursor, uh, by returning an array, and just even though it's not a one that I would ever do here, um, of actually doing it where everything is done just using native RPG, okay, without using uh, embedded SQL to actually retrieve the data. So this is the first program. This is one that returns a cursor. So uh, very simply here, uh, we have our parameters. So we've got our category code that's going to be passed in as a parameter and the description that we're going to return. Now, just to show you that this is like a true mixture, I have it here that the category table is on an F spec. So I'm doing a chain to get the category uh, description. And then to return the result set, all I do is declare the cursor with embedded SQL as one normally would do, and then open the cursor. Now, there is no fetch and there is no close of the cursor, especially no close of the cursor. Okay? And then we just specify that we're returning a result set. So we say set result sets for the cursor and we give the name of the cursor. And that's it. You can now end the program. So you can do a return or L or on or whatever you want. Then to wrap this as a stored procedure, we create or replace the procedure, our in and out parameters, exactly as we saw before. 
the external program, exactly as we saw before. But the extra thing we now add in is dynamic result sets. And we specify one because there is one result set that can be returned from this program. Okay? So um, as I say now, the important things, you don't do a fetch to the cursor in the program and you don't close uh, the cursor. You do a set result sets cursor to set the result. And then when we create it, we specify the number of result sets. Now, very important this that again, if we were uh, specifying, if we weren't taking the default of modifies SQL data, even though it doesn't, we have to at least say reads SQL data. Okay. And by the way, if we don't have that, if if I there if I specified no SQL, I would of course get an error. Okay, so this shows you what it looks like, and this is the example I just ran. We call the procedure. We see the result of the output parameter there, and we also see the result set. Okay, so let's look at a different way of doing it. This is by returning an array. So this is where I already have a sub-procedure in RPG. I have this uh, sub-procedure called return single cursor fetch. How do I come up with the names? I know, it's a gift. Um, and I will show you what this sub-procedure looks like. It's, it's, it's on the next slide. But what I have here is uh, a data structure array where each element is like data. So this is what's been populated here, okay? So when we call this, it is going to fill that array with data and it's going to return the number of rows in the result set to me, okay? So again, we do a chain to get the description. We call our sub procedure that populates this data structure array. I now want to return this data structure array. So we say set result sets array as opposed to cursor, okay? The name of the host variable for the array, which is data, so colon data, for, and we specify the number of elements in the array that we want to return, okay? So as simple as that. Now, this sub procedure, return single cursor fetch, this could be sitting out in a service program somewhere. So if it was my application, it definitely would be in a, a service program uh, somewhere. And this is what it would look like. Uh, very, very simple. You declare the cursor, open the cursor, multi-row fetch into the array, grab the number of rows that were fetched, and then close the cursor and return. Okay. Now, in this case, we are closing the cursor and everything, but that is because on the return, we're saying set result sets from the array, not the cursor. Okay, so the important bits of that, you define a data structure array, uh, you populate the array, in our case, from a multi-row fetch, and then we return that data structure array. Okay, this is one where the exact same logic that we just had there, except in this case, we're doing it with native RPG. So uh, the only, we're only going to have one uh, embedded SQL statement in here. So I've defined my data structure array here, okay, with however elements I want. And I do need to set a variable with the number of rows that I want to return, okay? So we populate the uh, from a read loop. Okay, so we do a set lower limits and we go into a standard read equal loop. For every row that I read, I put it into the next element of the array. Okay, so we're keeping a count in got rows and it's the exact same set result sets that we saw before. Okay, and there again, we see the uh, create for the procedure. Okay, all of these creates, by the way, have been the exact same. The only thing that's been different has been the name of the procedure and the name of the program that gets called. Okay, um, can you use star auto with the arrays, uh, Philip? Yes, yes, you can. Okay, but you still have to specify the the um, the number of rows that you're returning. Okay, in the in the set uh, statement. Okay, so this is just to show you an example of returning two result sets. Okay, now when you go to return multiple re uh, result sets, you have to do it using a cursor. You cannot do it uh, using an array. 
So you have to do a set result sets cursor. You cannot do a set result sets array. Um, so in this example, I'm going to just show two result sets. Uh, one is for the example we had before, all of the products uh, in a category. And the second result set is going to be all of the stock movement for those products. Okay, just two result sets. Okay, so as before, um, we have our parameters. We grab the um, description. Okay, and what we do is we declare and open our first cursor, declare and open our second cursor. The important thing here is different cursor names. That's really all that's important. And then on the set result sets, we say set result sets cursor, the name of the first cursor, comma, cursor, the name of the second cursor. And I think you get the idea if there were three cursors, it would be comma, cursor, the name of the third cursor, etc. You put in a, a, as many uh, as they are. Um, the big difference here, when we go to create the stored procedure, the dynamic result sets, Again, we just change the number. It's now two result sets uh, that, get, um, that get returned. Okay, um, little thing to watch uh, that you may, uh, especially if you're doing things where you're nesting calls. So a few things like a stored procedure calling a stored procedure, and that stored procedure is returning a result set, is whether you would need to specify when you're declaring the cursor, whether it's a return to caller or a return to client. Um, so uh, return to client usually is the one that you want and that, that is the default um, because you want it returned to the very outside. In other words, if you want to think of it this way, to the top of the call stack, uh, to whoever initiated the original call, not just to the procedure that called me. Okay, if we were writing this, as pure SQL using SQL PL. Um, the only option we have in there is to return a cursor, basically because PL doesn't have arrays and you can't return an array uh, within SQL PL. There are no data structure arrays. So here, um, again, the dynamic result sets, we name our program, set our debug view and begin. And it's exactly as we had in the RPG program we uh, declare the cursor. Um, uh, this, by the way, is just grabbing the description. Uh, we open the cursor and do the set result sets. Okay. Um, now, just a, a little word of warning on this, by the way. Uh, within SQL PL, set result sets is uh, proprietary to IBM I. If you want to write a stored procedure um, that you might be thinking of going, oh, well, I might want to use this on a, another platform um the way that in, sorry instead of specifying set result sets uh you would on the declaring the cursor you would just specify with return okay and this is the uh sort of the ANSI standard uh within pl uh for returning cursors okay to process result sets in rpg so i want to call a stored procedure from an rpg program and I want to process the result set um, in RPG, within the RPG program. Um, so what you need to declare is a variable with an SQL type of a result set locator. Okay, so this is one of the special SQL types. Okay, and then what we do is we call the stored procedure. We are going to associate our uh, locator with the stored procedure, and then we're going to allocate cursors to that result set, okay? And then we have to do row at a time processing. You cannot do a multi-row fetch to a result set from a stored procedure. Okay, so just so you can see all the codes of these bits, so we've defined it here, okay? What we do is, well, sorry, excuse me, we call the stored procedure, okay? So there's our call. So this is going to have generated a result set. We associate the result set locator. So that's the name of the host variable that we had defined on the previous slide. And we are associating it with the procedure of, whoop, my cursor gone there, with the name of the stored procedure, SP, 
uh, SPSQL return cursor, okay? And then, okay, that, that's sort of the hard work done, but now instead of declaring a cursor, we allocate, okay, whatever the name of the cursor is, the cursor for the result set, and we give it the name of the result set locator, okay? And now you have to do a fetch uh, a row at a time, okay? At the end, close your cursor. In this example, I'm just fetching the first row. I didn't bother putting in a, a complete loop. Okay, so um, one of the standard questions I usually get asked with this, and I, were, I thought it worth throwing in here, was, well, what's the difference between a stored procedure and a user-defined table function? Um, so the difference is with stored procedures, a stored procedure is like a program that you're calling. So you have a call command, an SQL call command that you use to do that. Um, you can have input and output parameters to it, as we saw. Um, and uh, the output comes directly back to whoever the, the caller is. And that's it. You just get the results. So if there are parameters, you get the parameters. If there's a result set, you get the complete result set. You can't play around with it. Okay, it, it's so so if the result set has 15 columns, you're getting the 15 columns and you're getting all of the rows. Okay, now a stored procedure will be usually be faster than a user defined table function. Okay, because it's a single program call and you get the result set back. And they're also, as we've seen, pretty easy to code. A user defined table function, though, is something that's called from within a select statement. So instead of a table name or a view name, you would have the name of this um, uh, user-defined table function. So it replaces a table. You can only have input parameters, so it can't return any values to you. And it is treated as a table in the select statement itself. So this means that you can join it to other tables. You can be more, you can say, I don't want all 15 columns. I only want three columns. You can put where conditions on what comes back, but it is going to be slower because the program that you have for the function gets called for every row. Okay, So if you had a result set that returned a thousand rows with a stored procedure, that's one program call. With a user defined table function, that's a thousand calls to the program, one for each row. It's actually a thousand and two. That's for another day. Okay. Also, they are trickier uh, to code. Okay. Well, folks, we, we have overrun a bit. Um, just so you know, in the handout, I put an extra bit in there about how to debug stored procedures. And this is running this using the system debugger in run SQL scripts. Okay. And that, by the way, also allows you to debug SQL PL. In other words, that if you've written a stored procedure using uh, SQL procedure language, um, you can, you know, directly debug the SQL. Or if you prefer, debug the C program uh, that's there behind it. Okay, that's it. Um, that's it, my bit for stored procedures. Um, I am not seeing any more questions pop in there. I, I had answered Philip's one about using the auto. Um, so, uh, so has anyone got any other questions? On fetching the cursor, do you just um, uh, check SQL state for the last record? Um, uh, it depends what, which, which fetch you're doing. Are you talking about like when you, yes, if, if you're doing a fetch, yes, it would be just checking uh, SQL state for, for last row. Yeah, and, and simple examples I had here, by the way, I'm just doing, uh, you know, fetches within the boundaries. Okay, I'm not doing uh, paging. Um, uh, how do you know how many rows are, are fetched? Sorry, Philip, th th this is standard embedded SQL. Uh, if you're doing it in RPG, um, it is in uh, the SQL ERD3. If you look at the example in the code there, you'll actually see it where it says got rows equals after the multi-row fetch. 
Um, if you were doing it in pure SQL, you, you would use uh, get diagnostics to get the number of rows that were returned uh, on a result set. Um, the, uh, the link to the handout I had put in the chat, um, but I will, uh, let me see, I will grab it again and drop it in there again. Oop, where is it here? So, um, okay, so, um, Doug, if you have a quick look in the uh, chat there, you, you will see the link. Um, okay, and Tommy. Uh, uh, when are you going to do a <laughs> on user defined table functions? Um, uh, who knows? Uh, uh, not in my plans at the moment. Uh, how do I get run SQL scripts widget in the Mac? You, you get ACS, you download ACS. That's it. It's there. Um, sorry, this is uh, bup, 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 bup. Uh, hang on a sec. If you, when you download ACS, that's Access Client Solutions, and there it is, that option there, run SQL scripts. Okay, uh, ACS, by the way, works on every platform. It's the exact same on Windows uh, as it is on um, uh, Linux as it is on Mac. It's the exact same one. Uh, that runs on them all. Okay, uh, just to mention, by the way, folks, in case anybody missed it, um, uh, Rob's email address is on one of the slides in my handout on the introductory slide uh, that uh, there as well. Um, so, um, and I'm sure, by the way, that CNX will be uh, in touch with um, with people uh, if there are. Uh, um, uh, as a follow-up uh, on the Lunch and Learn. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, all that remains for me, for me to say is, uh, Rob, Richard, uh, thank you very, very much uh, for your time today. Um, as always, a great demo. Um, I, I always hate seeing, uh, seeing products like this, by the way, where, you know, with, with you know, five clicks of a mouse, You've written what would take me twenty five minutes to write. <laughs> to write, you know. <laughs> you can code if you want to. <laughs> you can code if you want to. That's what I like. <laughs> it is, and it's um, uh, very, very sweet. So, uh, so, so, uh, Rob, Richard, uh, thanks again, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, the recording, by the way, um, will be available. Usually, uh, it might take us a few hours. John usually does an edit on it and that. But you will be able to access it through the same link uh, uh, that you got in the emails that you got for attending uh, and that as well. OK, so without uh, further ado, folks, um, I am going to uh, now end the webinar and hopefully uh, catch a few of you at uh, one or two of them next week. So bye, everyone. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Paul.